Hello and a very warm welcome back to the garden. It's one of those weeks where sadly every single day the weather looks pretty terrible. But today is International No Dig Day. So happy No Dig Day. This garden is a no dig raised bed kitchen garden. And if you want to find out more about the day, there's a link down below in the description. So as you've seen from the title, this video is about the art of nutrient harvesting. And you might be thinking, what on earth is this? Well, quite simply, it's seeing the value nutritionally of every single resource that's involved with gardening and your self-sufficiency journey, and then to understand how to make the most of it. So if you want a really stripped back definition of growing food, very simply, it's moving nutrients from one area to another. So when I'm harvesting this leek, for example, I'm harvesting all of the nutrients that it contains, and I'm gonna take it back home to eat. And this leek has used the nutrients in the soil to grow and convert those nutrients into an edible form that we can eat. And then what will happen once this leek bed is harvested, I'm gonna put a little layer of compost to add nutrients back in to replace the ones that I've extracted and to also help the soil life. A vegetable garden is a very simple five stage process. You've got the growing, the harvesting, the eating, the composting, the mulching, and then it comes back round to growing, harvest, eat, compost, mulch as a cycle like that. Every single stage of that cycle is a form of nutrient harvesting, and every single stage is a flow of nutrients in a continuous cycle. Now, I think sometimes when it comes to growing food, we've just got to strip things back to the simplest forms to relook at the simple processes and unpack how we can absolutely maximize and make the most of each one. Most of you who watch my channel are gonna be more so kind of hobby growers rather than doing it for a career. And because of that, we've got everything else happening in life and time is extremely precious. If there's one thing I think any gardener could wish for, it's more time, it's our biggest challenge. Now, perhaps you'll say that cost is the biggest challenge to gardening, but I've written a whole book to debunk that. Really, time is our most precious commodity. And if we look at the five stage process of the grow, harvest, eat, compost, mulch, we can start looking at each individual stage and element and find ways to make it more efficient for our time so we can make a bigger impact. So to echo that, let's explore the five stages of that cycle. I'm gonna be sharing some of my favorite tips and also the favorite things that I've learned over the years that have really helped me make as much impact as possible in the shortest space of time. And then after that, I'm gonna share something, something that's perhaps a little bit more on the controversial side, depending on kind of how you value your harvests, but I think it's really important to be discussed and I wanna open the conversation for that. Let's start with the first stage, which is grow and growing. All of these tips over the next five stages are focusing on being as efficient as possible so you can harvest more nutrient dense food. And the first one is whenever possible to direct sow. The reason why is when you direct sow seedlings, you don't have to faff about with sowing in modules, watering the modules, uh, which can you can easily forget. I found that plants when they're direct sown create much stronger root systems and they're much more resilient during drier weather. And also you're gonna be working a lot more with the seasons. Yes, module sowing, you can extend the season and you can use a polytunnel to start things off early, but at least when you direct sow, you're doing it when it's naturally gonna grow anyway. And so by not fighting against nature and the natural systems, you're gonna be saving a lot of time that you can then invest elsewhere in the garden and maybe prioritize a module sowing for crops that are perhaps a little bit harder to start off. If you find that time is really tight, reducing the number of varieties of a crop that you grow is one of the easiest ways to save a bit of time, bring a bit of time back. So for example, the majority of the crops that I grow, I'll only grow two, maybe three at a push, 
different varieties of that one crop over a season. Yes, there's some exceptions if I'm trialing different varieties to find a favorite or things like tomatoes, but sometimes by just limiting the number of varieties that you grow, what you're doing is you're reducing complexity. We all know that the more complex things are, the more time we have to spend with say planning or labeling and keeping track of seed packets. And the third tip for growing, kind of brings us back around to the first one. And it's exploring more about growing with the season as much as possible. When we try and grow against nature, yes, there's gonna be times where, say if I want some salads early on, I could use a hoop house, for example. But if we're thinking about time, and if you haven't got much time at all, you wanna make your gardening as easy as possible. Yes, perhaps some yields will suffer, but the amount of time that you're gonna free up for yourself is gonna be massive. So choose and grow crops when it's the time of year to grow crops. For example, now this garden's transitioning a lot more to the winter garden for all of the crops that are nice and hardy. I'm not having to worry about squeezing in extra things that I'm gonna to have to maybe run out and put a fleece on if a frost threatens. So work with nature, let nature do most of the work for you. The second part is harvesting. One of the biggest challenges that we face is we'll harvest all of the crops and then we need perhaps a little bit of time to process them in the kitchen. So one of the simplest things that you can do is to choose varieties that are the easiest to process in a kitchen. So a little example is say garden peas. I love garden peas, but all of that time that you spend podding and taking out those, those peas from a pod really, really adds up. So instead of growing, say, garden peas, grow something like monge tu or sugar snap peas. I love Oregon sugar snap because you harvest all the pods, just quickly top them, don't even have to take off the tail, and then cook them straight away. And suddenly you've saved so much more time and you're still getting the same flavors. The second one is to just create a dedicated salad bed, like the one in front of me here. The reason why is that if you have one space for all of your salads and fast growing leafy greens, is that it's really easy to come to the bed and you harvest everything in the same place. You don't have to walk around the garden if you just need some quick leaves for your lunch to take to work. And whenever a crop does go over, for example, this rocket is getting there, you just chop it at the base, compost it and transplant or sow something else straight away. It's real minimal fuss, it's really quick and saves time, obviously. In terms of harvesting, my favorite group of vegetables to harvest are winter vegetables because of their hardiness, but also you have those kind of months from November until March where they don't really grow, they just sit there in the ground. So perhaps one consideration is to transition your garden to have a little, little bit more of a focus on winter vegetables. Because in terms of maintenance, they're dead easy over the summer months. And then you just harvest what you need for your meals over winter. And so there's far less time investment for winter vegetables compared to those fast growing summer crops that like courgettes, if you forget about them or look away, suddenly you've got marrows and you don't know how to deal with it. Winter vegetables are just a lot more chill. For main crop potatoes, rather than growing them in a bed and then harvesting them all and then storing them, and sometimes if you accidentally put one bad potato in storage, all of them can spoil, what I actually do is I grow them in containers, in tubs, and then every week I can just empty a potato container over winter and then harvest what I want because those are perfectly happy stored in the containers in the soil. And so I'm just investing my time harvesting the potatoes as and when I need them. And that makes for a much more efficient process. Final tip to save time when harvesting, which I mentioned a bit with the salad bed, is when it's not a root crop, whenever you're harvesting, just cut the plant at the base when it's done, leave the roots in the ground. You don't need to worry about pulling them up and shaking off the soil, leave them in the ground. They contain nutrients, they contain carbon, they'll break down. That's just gonna help speed up your harvest process. The third part is a little bit different. Not so much loads of tips because it's about eating. The only thing that I would say, and it applies to every single gardener out there, is if you wanna save time or if you wanna feel like you're making the biggest difference with all of the time that you invest in your garden, is to grow the crops that you really enjoy eating. If there's any crop that you grow where you think, 
oh, if this suddenly disappeared off the face of the earth tomorrow and didn't exist, I wouldn't miss it. Then question, should you really be growing that when perhaps you could open up more space to grow things that you would far rather enjoy eating? Part four is composting. This just needs to be kept as simple as possible. When you're making compost, try to just aim to have a roughly equal volume of greens and browns material and put them on the compost bin. The only real work that I do is to chop up the material or rip it up quite finely just to help it break down. But that's really all you need to know for composting. Another tip is rather than composting everything, you can put a load of things, for example, some weeds into a bucket of water, let it soak for three or four weeks and then dilute one to 20. And then you've got a real simple but effective plant feed. So any crops that are looking a little bit unhappy or you're perhaps growing in soil that's a bit second rate, you can feed your crops with your completely natural plant feed. If you do want to give your compost a little bit of a helping hand, you can just go in and turn the piles of compost every couple of months just to help aerate it and help to move the material from the outside of a bin that hasn't broken down into the core of the bin where it will start to break down. One of my favorite forms of nutrient harvesting is looking at resources that in my local area that I can use and bring them bring the resources into the garden, bring the nutrients into the garden to then benefit, mainly by bulking up compost. I've done a whole video about this, but one of my favorite things is seaweed, for example. So look at what is around and available. There's gonna be a lot of autumn leaves right now. Look at how you can harvest those nutrients from elsewhere and bring them in to help benefit your garden. And by the way, if you have a crop in your garden that is just, it's sub-performing, you're just thinking, I'm not really sure I'm gonna get much out of it. It's taking up space. There is absolutely no shame in just pulling out or cutting out that, that crop and replacing it, put something else in that's gonna feed you. The fifth part is mulching. Very simple, I'm trying to aim to put on around three centimeters of compost as a surface mulch over each bed at any one point in the year. I think there's a little bit of people sometimes who feel a pressure of having to get every single bed ready by the end of autumn for winter. I do not follow that. I just mulch whenever a bed is ready or I feel like it. I'll start mulching beds from November all the way through until early to mid-March. If there's a crop that might stay in the bed all through, the, all through then the following spring, for example, leaks, I'll just chuck compost around the base of them and carry on. There's no need to overthink mulching as long as you, at some point over the year, put that layer of compost over the bed, you're fine. A second quick tip for mulching is to gather organic material and to spread it over the surface like normal mulch. This works if you're on top of slug populations, for example. So things like grass clippings, Harvest your grass clippings, grass clippings full of nutrients, another form of nutrient harvesting, and you just apply it as a mulch any stage over the year. Usually I do it around spring and summer and it's gonna break down. Look at what other things that you can bring, not just compost, to apply and protect your really precious soil. Before we quickly jump into the next part of the video, I just wanted to let you know in case you don't yet know, we're stocking these amazing Vigo garden raised beds on my online garden center, hughesgarden.com. They are my favorite metal raised bed brand for many different reasons. A really important point is that it's the first raised bed to have non-toxic USDA approved paint, which is really important because we wanna be growing food that is super healthy. Also because of the coating, it's gonna protect the beds and have at least a 20 plus year life expectancy. They're modular, so whatever kit you choose, you can make it to fit the exact size or space that your garden has to offer. We've also been having amazing feedback from customers about how beautiful these are and how easy they are to put together. Also, I've had a few of you ask if metal raised beds are suitable for your climate. Maybe you're in a cold climate or a hot climate. We've got a blog post describing all of the key climates and whether they are suitable or not. Link down below. So take a look at hughesgarden.com. We've got a range of different size options, different colors as well, and maybe put them on a Christmas wish list.
Okay, so let's say you have a glut of a crop like courgettes and you've given so many away, but you're still left with loads. What I actually want to say is that there is absolutely no shame in composting perfectly edible food. The reason why is that if you think about this courgette for a second, it's a load of nutrients in the shape of a courgette. It might be wasteful not being able to eat it, I understand that, but if I look at the garden as a whole, I don't see this as waste if I chuck it on the compost bin. Because when it breaks down, this might turn into next year's tomatoes or kale or lettuce, for example. So just seeing that a crop is nutrients described in a certain form, yes, some of them taste amazing, but don't worry about putting perfectly edible food on the compost pile because it's just going to enter the cycle again. And I think this is a bit con controversial because of people talking about food waste, etc. But I think it's so important to build resilience as a garden. And resilience is having control of the nutrition, the nutritional cycle of everything that goes on around here. And so I do say don't feel bad about composting things that you could potentially eat. I've got more than enough of these to eat. I'm gonna be composting some of them, especially the marrows, because I know it's going to contribute to long-term. So seeing everything as nutrients and allowing us to prioritize how we use those nutrients with a core goal of growing as much food as possible that we can actually eat is the key. Compost to me is more important than the crops in the garden there because the crops in the garden wouldn't exist if it wasn't for compost. For me personally, prioritizing compost means that I'm okay to put perfectly edible food on here to break down to contribute for future years. A garden in a sense is a nutrient bank with lots of different kind of banking accounts. So the current account is all of the crops that are currently available that I can eat. Now I can extract some of that money from the current account, i.e. some of the crops, and put them into my savings account, which is my compost bin. Because what I'm doing is that I'm locking them away and they're breaking down and then I can extract from that savings account whenever I need nutrients to put back out onto the garden. The investment account is all of the nutrient harvesting that I do from surrounding areas. For example, leaves and seaweed because I'm investing my time and I'm bringing it into the garden and it's going to help further promote my ability to become self-sufficient. And if we're going into the really metaphorical description of bank accounts and a garden, I think that the best description of a pension account is all of the seed saving that you do. And seed saving is another form of nutrient harvesting. With compost being so important, watch this video here on how to become more self-sufficient in compost and save costs. And again, happy no dig day.